time for our next uh, speaker, who is also a good friend of mine, Sarah Mitchell. We used to be postdocs together in the, I don't know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I think. Yeah, when uh, I was much younger. When we were much younger and smarter. Uh, well, I'm still smart, so. <laughs> Okay, so thank you to Morden uh, for the kind invitation to be here again. Um, I think I've got considerably older since last year, but you know, hopefully I have some exciting data to tell you. Um, so today I'm going to continue sort of the theme that Jennifer just brought up about why we should study females, because they are super interesting and I think also important, and if we really want to have you know, healthcare equity and equality, this is an important thing to consider. Okay. Now I got it working, it's good. Okay, so when we think about uh, geroprotective interventions, timing matters. Um, so there was a recent survey conducted by Elysium and OnePoll, which looked at uh, 2,000 Americans, and it really surveyed their um, sort of ideas about aging and healthcare and you know, when we need to think about uh, intervening here. And so of these 2,000 Americans, 66% said it takes too much effort to be healthy. Not, not, not unsurprising. Um, when they asked, you know, when do you plan to deal with your health? 63% plan to deal with it when they get older. Um, and, you know, this, as the sort of uh, respondents got older, the percentage of which who wanted to deal with it obviously increased. And when they asked, when, when do you feel old? Or when was the first time that you felt old? The average age was actually 47 years, um, which, you know, is not that far away from where I'm going to be in maybe 10 or 15 years. So, you know, this is not what we would have expected, but it's what generally people are feeling. Um, and so when we think about the sort of life phase equivalencies, when we compare uh, mice to humans, I really like to show this um, illustration from the Jax Labs. And so basically what you can see, maybe I'll just do this pointer. Oh, never mind. Um, basically, what you can see is here we're comparing life phase equivalencies between uh, humans, oh, humans, and also mice. And so the age at which these people are saying, I'm starting to feel old, is basically coming in here somewhere around 12 to 15 months. And so maybe this suggests that when we think about developing interventions, this is where we should be starting our interventions. Um, one thing I do want to point out, one caveat sort of about this data, which really I think goes to what Jennifer was, was talking about, is that, you know, as a female, you don't start thinking about when you're getting old, when you're 47 or older. You know, it's really when you first take your first health class and they tell you all about, you know, as you get older, you lose your eggs. Um, and so, you know, really when we think about these kinds of things, we need to be thinking about um, gender equality. And so here is some data from the uh, interventions testing program um, in the US. And for those of you not familiar with this program, basically what it is is a, a testing program where you can submit compounds. So anyone can propose a compound to be tested in male and female mice. Um, they start them at different time points, uh, depending on the intervention. And so this is sort of a compilation over the past of the compounds tested over the past 20 years. And so what you can see is that if we think about this age in mouse years, when you know, humans are starting, are starting to feel old, it's shown here by this uh, dashed line. But what you can see with most of our interventions is that they're really tested in young animals. There's a few which are tested at that age or a little bit older, but generally we, we tend to test in young animals. And so of the ones that have been uh, submitted to the ITP, the asterisks down the bottom, hopefully you can see them, these show the ones that have had significant effects on lifespan, with the blue having a, a positive effect in males, the red having a positive effect in females. And so what you can see is that, you know, there's not that many, and some that have uh, effects in males versus females. And so this graph here is actually a really nice compilation of all of the control data from the ITP. And so what you can notice from this uh, graph is that, you know, it's as I said, a compilation of all the males and the females um, across all the different cohorts of the drugs that have been tested. And what you can notice is that the shape of the curve for the males and females is actually quite different. Um, and this is not something we generally tend to consider. We normally think about, you know, mean and maximal lifespan, but not so much about the shape of the curve and how this changes with our interventions. And so we can plot all of the interventions that have been tested in the ITP 
on a graph like this comparing uh, male median survival difference versus female difference. And what you can see is that we have a population of drugs down here which don't have any positive or negative effects on lifespan. But then what we can see is that we have some drugs which work in females, some drugs which work in males, and then also some drugs which work in both males and females, which is the top here. And so if we really zoom in on uh, two of these interventions, which are both, which are rapamycin and then a combination drug of metformin plus rapamycin, what we can see is that there's really interesting differences between the survival curves of these animals. So what we can see with the males is a positive effect of either rapamycin or the combination of metformin and rapamycin on median lifespan. We also see a similar effect in the females. But what's really interesting about this data is that when you compare sort of this uh, early on in the study, we see two different patterns between males and females. So males often have this uh, sort of early, early uh, intervention mortality, which is not there in the females. And so I think this really tells us that you know, the effects of geroprotective interventions are different across the sexes, and it really highlights the need and the importance of studying both males and females. And so this brings us to the question and sort of some of the work that I'm uh, now doing is, you know, how can we better understand sex differences using a translationally relevant study design? And so here are some old mice. They're super cute. Um, and so the sort of study design that we've really developed in the lab has been uh, sort of a combination of you know 10 years of experience as a postdoc in Rafa's lab and then as a scientist in uh, Jay Mitchell's lab at Harvard and so what we've developed is this really deep phenotyping study design and so here what we do is we take old mice uh, here our age of onset is about 21 months and we do oops repeated longitudinal phenotyping across the lifespan so we measure a bunch of different uh, health span outcomes as shown here and then we also build in cross-sectional sacrifices. And this is really nice because it allows us to link our physiological data to our omics data. And in this study with the um, examples that I'll show you, we did a combination of both uh, dietary interventions as well as sort of a novel weight loss drug intervention. And the beauty of this kind of study design, which I think is you know, really exciting, is that when we start with a large number of mice, so in this study we had about 500, and we do this repeated longitudinal phenotyping of these animals. You know, when you're getting up to eight or more time, po uh, time points with over 31 different outcomes, you know, before we even get into the omics data, we're looking at more than 100,000 physiological data points. And so this, I think, is a really strong uh, data set which will allow us to discover maybe some novel things about aging and how our interventions impact aging in male and female mice. And so I'm just going to walk you through uh, the lifespan curves for the animals before we get on to something maybe a little bit more exciting. Um, and what I'm showing you here is just 15% uh, calorie restriction. So we take mice, they're 21 months of age, and we give them a sort of mild calorie restriction. And so this is different to the typical 40% calorie restriction, which is normally used in studies. But, you know, we thought, let's give it a try and see what happens. And so what you can see is uh, the males over here and then the females on the right. And what you see is a differential pattern of lifespan extension. And so similar to what I showed you in the previous curves, in males, for some reason, we have this uh, population of non-respondent animals who, when you start them on an intervention, they just don't like it. They say, I'm not going to do this, and then they die. What's interesting is that we don't see this in the females. Why this happens, we're not sure. This is something we're really interested in, um, and it's something we're sort of following up on. And so again, you see sort of differential patterns in the lifespan curve with a common shared effect of uh, increase in median lifespan between males and females. When we look at our methionine-restricted restrict, methionine animals, um, so these are animals which have a diet restricted in uh, methionine, completely devoid of cysteine. And these, the great thing about this sort of diet, um, as I think was you know, talked about yesterday, was that these animals can eat ad libitum. So it's really a sulfur amino acid restriction. Um, and what we see, again, consistent with our CR animals and our male mice is this early life mortality, or early intervention mortality rather, because these animals are started at 21 months of age. And so we see this in the males, but not in the females. And actually, when we look at the, different, the differential patterns between the males and females, what we can see is that these females at least, it's starting to suggest that they're having a, oops, a squaring of the curve. So normally this is associated with uh, health span life, 
uh, health span benefits. And what we see that's different between the males and females is that the males tend to have this sort of late life kick in with a super long lived animal. And then when we looked at how our lifespan was different with our drug, what we saw for the first time was that we don't have this uh, early intervention mortality in our male mice. We see beneficial effects on median lifespan in both males, oops, males and females. But what's really nice and what is really cool about this drug is that we see this really nice squaring of the curve. So that's sort of this pattern indicating an improved health span. So I've shown you that late life interventions can extend lifespan, but what about health span, the thing that we're potentially most interested in? And so one of the metrics, health span metrics that we're using in the lab is this mouse clinical frailty index. And so you've heard about this today, you've heard about it yesterday. It's a really nice uh, index developed by Susan Howlett in uh, Canada in 2014. And what it's based upon is a sort of reverse translation from a human frailty index. Um, so they took the human, human frailty index and reverse translated it into mice. And so we have a deficit accumulation scale across a number of sort of health domains in the animal. And what it really does is sort of give a nice, you know, overview of whole organism aging and in a relatively non-invasive and easy to do score. And so in a, pub a paper that we published um, in 2020, we looked at um, how, these, how the different parameters change across, as a function of age across mice. And what we can see across some of the um, categories shown here, such as menace reflex, tremor, gait, uh, tail stiffening, et cetera, is that these parameters don't change in the same fashion. They don't change in a linear fashion. And so I think this is quite interesting because Again, in humans, aging is also not, things don't change in a, in a linear fashion. And so when we went to our study and we measured frailty, what I'd like to show here is the males on the left and the females on the right. And I think what's really interesting about this data is that we see that our interventions can modulate frailty in males, but not in females. So on this graph, every point represents a single animal. And so, you know, we have a huge amount of data across the lifespan. And this clear pattern where we can modulate frailty in males but not females is really, I think, quite apparent. And why this is, we don't know, we don't understand, but this is something that we're trying to, you know, work towards. And so when we think about how different frailty parameters change across sex and as a function of chronological versus biological age, here is just a heat map looking at the different uh, parameters in the frailty index and then how they correlate with uh, chronological age on the left and then biological age on the right. And here we're sort of measuring biological age as basically the time left to live. And what you can see is that we see sex differences uh, in the correlation with different uh, frailty parameters and that this is also different between if we're thinking about chronological age versus biological age. And sort of as an example, if we look at body weight at the top here uh, on the right, what we can see is a sort of differential uh, correlation between body weight and biological age in males versus females. And so when we think about sort of trying to understand this more, we can really collapse this data down uh, into sort of two principal components using principal component analysis. And so here, every, uh, again, every point is an individual mouse. And then the color basically relates to the time left to live. How much, how many days does the animal have left before it's gonna die? And so you can see the few red ones are basically sort of, they have a long time left to live versus the dark blue ones, they're about to die. And so we can really look at how, you know, these sort of um, frailty parameters change as a function of age. And what we see with, with males is that both um, uh, parameters change in both PC1 and PC2. Whereas in females, it seems to be driven primarily by PC1. And so when we look at sort of the weights of uh, the different scores, it really gives us an appreciation that frailty is different between males and females. And maybe this frailty index that we're using is not, could be improved for use in females. And I think this really, you know, goes back to the data that I showed you with our, you know, frailty interventions. We see that they extend lifespan, but we don't see changes in frailty. So maybe we need to sort of tweak the frailty scale to better uh, capture frailty in aging females. And so one of the other things that we've really been interested in doing is 
incorporating sort of translational uh, metrics into our studies. And so to do this, one of the things we've been uh, interested in is actually hematology. And so this is uh, similar to what, when you go to the doctor, you get a complete blood cell count. It's really a poor man's fax, uh, to put it nicely. And so we have this great machine. It's called a hemovet machine. Um, the fantastic thing about this is that you can get all of these hematology parameters in your mice in repeated sampling, and you only need 27 microliters of blood. So it really is a valuable resource for getting a lot of uh, data about the immune system and the blood composition in a relatively easy and non-invasive me uh, measure. And so here I'm just showing you an example of some data from our study, looking at our different interventions, uh, males and females again. And again, every data point is an individual mouse, and we're doing repeated sampling of these animals. And so what you can see with the neutrophils, which I think is uh, consistent with human studies, is you see an increase over age. And what you can see with our interventions is that they, excuse me, uh, mitigate this age-related increase. And what's really cool about this hematology data, which is, I think, different to our frailty data, is that even though the females have lower levels of the numbers of cells, what our interventions do to these numbers is consistent across males and females. And so this suggests to us that incorporating this kind of hematology data into our studies may be an objective measure of uh, frailty, or maybe a more objective measure of how uh, aging, how our interventions are changing aging. And so we can also look at the associations between uh, frailty index and hematology. And so again, what's really nice is that when we look at the, how these two measures interact together, we can see that basically they're changing in the same direction um, in both males and females. And so this really suggests to us that by in incorporating both frailty and hematology together, this may be a really objective way to sort of capture the frailty syndrome in aging females. And again, when we look at sort of how different components are changing as a function of sex, we see that, you know, there's nice overlap between uh, our parameters. Oops. And so, you know, really beyond just looking at absolute scores and associations with outcomes, what we're really interested in doing is using this frailty data and hematology data to predict different physiological outcomes in our studies. And so as an example of how we've done this um, in a couple of published papers, uh, this was published in 2020 through a collaboration with um, Alice Kane and David Sinclair's lab at Harvard. And here we use frailty um, and machine learning approaches to develop age and life expectancy clocks. And then more recently with our uh, collaborators at the Harvard School of Public Health, we're able to use both frailty and gut microbiota to develop these models to predict healthy aging in male mice. But beyond this, one thing we've done recently is to look at how we can use frailty and hematology to predict tumor burden in aging animals. And so this here is just a sort of representative graph where basically we used a random forest uh, classifier and what we did is we took this um, classifier and into the model we put baseline and three month frailty and hematology data. And then we asked the model Using, this, using these, uh, these data, can you predict which mouse is going to have a liver tumor or a spleen tumor at death? And what we found in sort of a first pass um, with this model was that with about 70% accuracy, using only baseline and three-month follow-up data, hematology and frailty, we could relatively reliably, reliably pick, um, predict who, which mouse is going to have a liver or a spleen tumor. And so we're now looking to sort of um, improve the accuracy of this model um, by incorporating in geropathology uh, scoring of our tissues. And so just as sort of a summary and outlook, what I've showed you is that late life interventions can extend lifespan, um, but what's really interesting is that there are non-responder animals. And we really need to consider both males and females when we're testing these geroprotective interventions. What's really cool is that aging trajectories of males and females are very different, so again, you know, we really need to study both sexes. Um, and then I think the value of these kinds of studies is that we can use high dimensional data to non-invasively model healthy aging beyond just lifespan. And so this is sort of where we're going next. And so I just want to finish, because I'm almost over time, sorry, Morden, uh, with my acknowledgement slide. Um, so I'd really like to, you know, acknowledge our late mentor, Jane Mitchell um, at ETH Zurich, and we're in part of the Healthy Aging Group. 
Uh, I'd also like to give a shout out to Mike MacArthur, um, who really has stepped up to, you know, help me lead the group and take care of the students, um, you know, after Jay's passing. And as a plug to our students, Charlotte is here in the audience. She also has a poster. So if you want to learn more about methionine restriction and how you can just take this diet instead of uh, exercising, you should go and visit her poster. Uh, Uslim also has another poster uh, looking at late life um, interventions in C. elegans and mice. So thank you and... Well. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. That was really great. We have a question here from uh, Marco. And I Thank you very much for a very nice talk. So I have a question. You have seen so many animals in these uh, interventions. Do you think there are some preferential tissues that might respond differently um, if, to the interventions and they are maybe more sexually dimorphic in how they respond. Yeah, I definitely think that, you know, different interventions can target different tissues differentially. Have we looked at this? No. Are we interested to do this? Yes. Um, you know, everything sort of comes down to money and time. So I think the, you know, important thing about geroprotective interventions is that they may have different mechanisms, so what applies to one might not apply to others. And I think this is a challenge when we think about this kind of stuff, yeah. Question from Rafa. Uh, I was wondering, are the terms of mortality? Can you take your microphone? I missed closer? half of that, sorry, Rafa. Yeah, it's okay. So, have you checked the intervention that you've done? Sorry change, alter the, the outcome, alter the trajectory of death of the populations? What are the predictors in the reality? It's still missed half. Sorry. It's, uh, <laughs> Maybe I can come down and talk to you right now, because I still missed half of the question. All right, I'm going to go uh, Try again. to you. So, for the interventions that you did late in life, yes. do you have enough data to use some of the variables to predict mortality? Uh, basically, what we've looked at just right now is you know, standard lifespan, and now we're sort of looking at this physiological data to make these models to do this prediction. So that's what, you, mm, right, that's a little, the logical next step, no? Yeah. Right, awesome, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks, Very Rafa. nice, thank you so much, Sarah. Fantastic talk. And, uh, we will have a break. We are running a little bit late. Um, so we will meet back in about seven minutes. Uh, one thing, if you want to go out and uh, into the courtyard, you can throw some darts for, uh, for actually uh, um, doing target uh, identification. So uh, there's a little activity out there. Seven minutes.